Our guest today is Tana Gertz. Fans of The Apprentice will recognize Tana as the runner-up on season three. Fans of the NBC show Fear Factor will remember her in Reality Stars Fear Factor. Tana is an entrepreneur, an inspirational speaker, a life coach, business consultant, author, devoted wife, mom of two, and so much more. But it hasn't always been easy for her. Sit back and get ready for a power-packed conversation with Tana Gertz. Tana, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your time. We know how busy you are. So there are so many positive things to talk about in the next 50 plus minutes. I mentioned that life hasn't always been as fun or easy for you as it is today. So let's get the negative experiences out of the way first. Years ago, you were married to an alcoholic, your first husband. You left him with your two children, moved in with your parents, basically starting from scratch again, and reinvented yourself. Talk about what it was like to be broke with two children and need to reinvent yourself. What did you do to, to help your mental health? Well, it's never easy to voluntarily sign up to be a single parent. Um, and that's what happened to me. I knew that I needed to leave uh, my first husband and I'm not a quitter. I'm a very loyal person. So that was very difficult um, to give up on someone, to give up on a marriage, to give up on my dreams um, and to not know what the future was going to look like with two babies, uh, the father of you know, their father. And so it was scary uh, for starters. I will never lie to anybody. It's a scary first step. Um, my mental health had always been strong. However, when you have to sign up for something that is scary, risky, um, dangerous, meaning, you know, leaving with the clothes on your back, stressful. I left with nothing. I left my entire house, my car, my clothes, my children's uh, bedrooms, their everything, my friends. Um, so it was scary, but my mental outlook was, you know, moving forward, I have to um, figure this out. And I'm not the type of person that's really into the details. Uh, I don't need an outline before I jump into things. So I knew I needed to do it. I knew I would be successful, but I just, first step is to go. And, uh, and that's, that's how I started this whole process. And uh, I've never looked back. And did you know what you wanted to be when you started that reinvention process? Well, when I coach people and clients, the number one thing I always draw, we always go to is let's start at the basics. What are you good at? And I knew that I was always good at sales. So I knew I could sell something. I just didn't know what that something would be. Um, so yeah, I always say, start with what you've got, what, you know, what's in your toolkit. And uh, being a successful entrepreneur for most of my life, I knew I could sell. And that was going to be the means for me to make a living for me and my children. And how long did it take to reinvent yourself? And when did you feel that you'd actually succeeded? Well, I remember saying to myself when I had to move into my mother and father's basement with my babies, a three-year-old and a one-month-old, I remember saying, you know, this is great. Uh, I'm so blessed to have parents that will allow me to move in. Some families are like, you're, out, you're on your own, you know, it's your mess, clean it up. And I was fortunate. I come from a nice, strong Italian supportive family and, and the nest is all, there's always room in the nest. So uh, the three of us came moving back in and there was a little bit of, you know, humility there. Like, you don't, you don't supposed, you're not supposed to move back in with your parents. Uh, but I pushed my ego aside and I just said one year, I made a goal that by within one year of the day I moved in, I wanted to be out on my own, in my own house, my children having their own room. And I wanted to be fully independent of my parents' help. And I'm fortunate to say that eight months later, so I, you know, I made my goal by four months. Eight months later, I was out on my own, renting my own little cute house. Both of my children had their room and I knew I could do it. And I had done it uh, with the help of my sister who let me work her store selling um, and with the help of my mom helping me with the children so that I could get out and go to work and not have to pay for childcare. That was a huge help. So in eight months, I, I was back up and rocking and rolling. So you mentioned your ego knowing how focused and driven you are, how hard is it for someone in that mindset to push that ego aside and, and sort of grab yourself by the bootstraps and move forward? Is it something that came easy to you? Something you just put in check and you had to do? Well, it comes easy to me because I'm not a crybaby. I'm not the type of person that's like, poor me. I'm such a victim. No, I overlook the red flags. Uh, no, I chose to marry him. I let his looks get in front of the habits, uh, whatever the case may be. So I'm not the type of person that cries over spilt milk. I'm just like, what do we got to do? Let's go, let's do it. 
Uh, so the, the ego was just like, I'm embarrassed, you know, like I couldn't bring a date home. The man that I started dating was like, Hey, do you want to come in my mom and dad's house? Uh, so it was a little bit embarrassing just because I didn't have my own space, but that only lasted for a little bit. So ego has never been a really big thing for me. I just move on. And until I am successful, uh, I work at that. You didn't want to invite him over for Sunday dinner with macaroni and sauce or gravy? <laughs> well, he did do that <laughs> many of times. <laughs> so as you're going through that eight month reinvention process, how did you find and keep hope during that, per during that period? And what kept you from giving up? You know, hope is always something that I've had. Hope is out there for everybody. I coach a lot of people that are depressed, uh, that are uh, very discouraged, very filled with despair in their life. And, and a lot of people don't have hope. But I always say, uh, if you wake up and the sun is shining and you've got food in your refrigerator and clothes on your back and shoes on your feet, there's hope for you. Uh, so hope is always something that I have never struggled with. And I hope that a lot of people don't struggle with that because we are so blessed in so many ways that people forget. Um, but I just kept, you know, kept moving forward and, um, and I didn't have a problem with struggling with hope. And what was the other part of the question, Chris? And yeah, just what kept you from giving up? Is it just hope well, or is there drive? Drive and my kids. I didn't want to look at my kids and have them be like, you know, why don't we have food to eat, mommy? You took us away from daddy, you know, you, you, you. It would be, you know, the blame would be put on me. Uh, where now my children say, thank you for giving us an incredible life with an incredible man that took us in as his own. Uh, you know, blood is not always thicker than water. I mean, this was a man who took on my children as if they were his own and was a godsend, actually, a complete godsend for us. So my children thank me. Um, and they thank me because they see what I left, private planes, uh, filet mignon, uh, you know, the lifestyle I left was a very wealthy lifestyle. And you never stay for money. You never stay for power. You stay to give your children a good example. And if you don't have that, you better reinvent yourself and get the hell out. As I've seen over the first five minutes of the show and our listeners have heard, you're an extraordinarily positive and upbeat person. With high gas prices, inflation, political strife, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the lasting effects of COVID and on and on, many people are finding it very difficult to be optimistic. And of course, many people were pessimistic even before all these things unfolded. You mentioned hope a minute ago. Is there anything else that helps you stay so positive and what advantage or advantages has your positivity given you in life? Well, definitely having a positive outlook has given me so many opportunities. I believe that if you are a grateful person, more blessings come your way. That's the number one thing I teach in my audiences and in my coaching is gratitude. Gratitude that you can wake up. Gratitude you can take a walk and get vitamin D. Gratitude you have food. Gratitude you have family. The list goes on and on. Uh, so gratitude is, uh, is an amazing tool um, for people to stay positive. I definitely um, don't wallow in the negative aspects. I don't hang around negative people. I don't allow negative influences in me. I actually got rid of a business manager because she always wanted to say, oh my gosh, you should see what people are saying about you. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care what people are saying about me. If you can't pick that up, you need to go. Like we're not even dwelling in that space. Um, in this world, as you mentioned, yeah, there's a lot of really negative things going on. Uh, people are calling me saying, I have to cancel uh, on meeting you. I have to cancel on the speaking engagement. We can't afford to have it. Gas prices are so high. Uh, I say, turn off the news, bottom line. Um, the news is a very depressing vehicle that is a tool to get people more depressed, to get people to stay home, to get people to be fear-based. And I say, turn it off, turn off the noise and tune into God. Uh, what are your blessings? What are your resources? So many of us have so many resources, but, and they don't even know it. And they're not even tapping into it because they're so consumed with the TV box or the radio uh, or the nonsense. And so I, I, I watch zero television. I listen to zero radio, except for music. Um, and I don't, I don't entertain it. I don't care what my stocks are doing. I don't care about my husband's 401k. I don't care about his Bitcoin that is going, Bleh. I don't care because that's all negative. Let's talk about what's, what's positive and what's actually real. 
I'm so glad you're on the show because you and I are so similar. You know, I hardly watch TV at all. I've never binge watched a show throughout COVID. Haven't been watching the news. And I yell at my wife because she's just constantly doom scrolling on her phone. I'm like, just turn it off. Just turn it off. And to your point, focus on the positives. You got three healthy, beautiful children. And your point, yes, is this a market correction right here? Yeah. Does it happen all the time? Yes, it does. Don't look at it and look at it a year from now and it'll be better. Exactly. You know, a moment ago, you mentioned gratitude. What are you most grateful for in your life? I am most grateful for my health, to be able to get up every day, to not need coffee, caffeine, drugs to get going. I mean, and, I, and some people, when I say that, they laugh, but I'm like, no, you don't understand how many people are on drugs, whether it's um, an antidepressant, an, ang an anti-anxiety medication, uh, whatever it is. Uh, I would say with my experience coaching and speaking and consulting, uh, 75 to 85% of the population is walking around some sort of in, in, in some sort of an induced state uh, to be happier. Um, and, and so health, my health, to be able to wake up, not need it, to be energized from the morning, my feet hit the ground, honestly, until I go to bed, I am full throttle, charged up, fired up, ready to rock and roll. I want to be active. I want to be making a difference. I want to be helping people. I want to be loving people. I want to be making money. I want to be conquering it all. Can we bottle this somewhere and sell them? I mean, this is fantastic. Well, you know, I sell energy. A lot of people say, what is it that you actually sell besides speaking engagements and consulting? And what it is, is energy. Uh, people buy me, whether it's in a speech or whatnot, consulting opportunity, campaigning, whatever, to get that mindset of, it's not like, you know, you're born with the energy that you have, but you can tap into other people. And I know there's many people in my life that leech on to me because they want a little of that. And I'm very guarded and careful about who gets access to it. You sold me. I'm buying some energy today. <laughs> so Tana, you have two sayings, at least I know of, and probably more, that have been instrumental in your success. Uh, I love these. The first, fear has never been a factor. The second is become better, not bitter. Unpack both of those and how you live them in your everyday life and in your relationships. Well, fear has uh, never been a factor because if you live in a fear-based world, you don't take opportunities. When I decided to go on The Apprentice, I wanted to go on because I wanted to win the purse of the $250,000 job, bring that home and make more businesses or to have more resources or avenues to um, help my family. So if I was afraid of what I would look like on TV, how I would be edited, uh, how I would be portrayed, what my friends would think, what my clients would think, I would have never went. Same with fear factor. If I would have thought, you know, I'm a mom, what the hell's a mom doing going on fear factor, kicking butt with, you know, these young people in a bikini. I mean, you know, if you get into that, then you don't take chances. If I was afraid the first time I stepped on stage, I would have never become a professional speaker that is sought after. Um, so there's just so many things that people are afraid of looking like a fool. People are afraid of embarrassing themselves or their family. And I just never cared. So fear has never been a factor since I was a young child. And I can remember as early as first grade telling the teacher she's a terrible teacher and let me teach the class. I mean, that was the truth. Um, and then being and don't be bitter, be better. Um, and that came from, you know, divorce, because a lot of men, including my ex-husband, were like, ah, you leave me, honey, you're never going to amount to crap. Really? OK, let me show you. Um, so there's a little bit of, of that competitive spirit, that drive that uh, you're not going to tell me how it's going to go. How about I was doing you a favor? Let me tell you how this is going to go. So, um, but I, I see in men mostly that I consult and, and coach, a lot of them are really angry at their ex-wives. They're bitter. Uh, they hate her. They, um, they see that she's ruining their, ch their children. And a lot of women and men do that. And so they're like, I can't be better. I am so bitter. I want to strangle her. But bitterness doesn't allow for growth. It's a negative trait where if you go, I want to be better, I want to kick butt, I want to go on The Apprentice, I want to be the runner-up, if not the winner, I want to make the money, I want to get the jobs. In that mindset, all the jobs and all the opportunities come, and the money and the fame, even though I wasn't looking for it, but it came. You know, all of that 
wow, had I sat on the sofa and ate bonbons and been bitter about a man I chose to marry, then I would have never done all the stuff. So both of those are really great traits. And I, I teach those everywhere I go because the world needs to hear those. And you talk about what people are afraid of. And I also think today, certainly in the post-COVID world, people are afraid of failure. Yeah. You know, some, some of the greatest American and, and global successes have been from people, from individuals who have failed and then reinvented themselves, have been picked up again by the bootstraps and gone forward. Why do you think people are afraid of failure? Well, some people are a perfectionist. I know I have a daughter. She's a perfectionist. She's a genius. Uh, well, not really, but she's very <laughs> bright. I mean, she hasn't been labeled that, but she's very bright. You know, went to school uh, for chemistry and whatnot. So she's really smart. And a lot of times I'm like, do that, Tori. And she's just hesitant. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you, you you're not taking after me? Like, jump in, go for it. And I started to peel it back and go, wait, she wants to be perfect. It's okay to fail. Like it's, it's okay to fail. Actually failing is good. Um, and so some people are perfectionists. Some people get so paralyzed by the analysis of things that they're just locked up and boom, the opportunity slid by. So those are really the two reasons that I think, and most people are cowards. Um, and most people have no self-confidence, which is another thing that I teach and sell, confidence. Uh, confidence holds people back in a lot of regards um, and, and most of the reasons why a lot of people don't succeed is confidence, lack of confidence. As a life coach, you also tell people to never stay for money, never stay unless you're being treated like a queen or a king. Another one of my favorites, never take crap from anybody. Yeah. A lot of people who make the choice of staying in mediocre or worse relationships would tell you that you have to make some compromises in life and no relationship is perfect. What do you tell those people? And do you have any other relationship nevers or do those cover all three bases? Those do not cover all three bases. There are a lot of nevers. Um, I have a whole presentation called uh, Noticing the Red Flags, which talks about the nevers. Uh, I'll just hit on a few nevers. You know, if you find out that the person that you're dating is a, is a big drinker, binge drinker, gets drunk every single time he or she has alcohol, and there's a problem, whether it's a car accident, a fight, uh, damage in the house, a punched wall, you got to go. If you find out somebody is using drugs recreationally, you got to go. Those are two. Um, temper, you got to go. Women have horrible tempers too. This is not just on men. So those are a few of the, you know, deal breakers. Um, also, you know, you got to talk about politics and religion. You know, where do you stand on that regard? Do you want children? Those are all big, big things that a lot of young people are not talking about that are very important issues. You can't be a conservative and date a liberal and then think that marrying a liberal with the families um, is going to be a good thing because it just doesn't mix. Uh, so those are, that's, that's the latter part of the question. Um, what was the first part? <laughs> what was the nevers? You covered all the nevers. And what was the first part? Oh, queen, king and queen. King and queen. You know, so yeah, absolutely. So no perfect is, no marriage is perfect. However, I've been married to my husband for 21 years. We've never had a fight. Uh, that doesn't mean that he gets on my nerves and I don't get on his nerves. That doesn't mean that I've gotten short with him. That doesn't mean that he has, you know, asked me to like quit, you know, doing certain things like taking care of the world and trying to be Mother Teresa. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we give and take. But if you start at the core basic, treat your man like a king and treat your woman like a queen uh, and they'll treat you the other way. So it's just common courtesy, but a lot of people just don't. Uh, want to put forth the effort. I think because my husband, Curtis, is my second husband, I am so grateful for him. I believe God sent him to me. I treat him like a king because he saved me and my children um, from a life of loneliness. Not that I'd ever, you know, be alone, but maybe. Um, he, he, he just, he's, he is our king and he's my king and I will always treat him like that. And he treats me like the sun rises and sets on me. He tells me every day I'm beautiful. He tells me he loves me. And I think it's a, it's a behaved, it's a learned behavior. And a lot of people started the relationship treating each other poorly. And it's hard to go, hey, guess what? I heard somebody, I heard Tana say, I should treat you like a king. I'm gonna turn it all over. It's kind of hard to, to come in halfway, halfway through the game. 
Um, so I, I, and then never take crap. You only have to take crap once if you're somebody like me to realize that's never going to happen again. Um, because a lot of times I've asked myself, you know, why did I allow myself to be controlled? I'm not, I'm not tameable. I'm very untamable. So how did that happen? And it happens over a series of uh, biting your tongue, not making, wanting to make waves. Um, you know, I was with like my husband and first husband and when things started getting a little bit off kilter and, and I could tell that the relate, like that it was going to be like a louder verbal com conversation. I back down because I don't want, I don't want loudness. I don't want anger. I don't want that negative energy. And so I felt like I compromised and therefore compromising allows you to start slowly become, be, slowly allows you to become controlled and that's never going to happen again. And it has it. One of your missions in life is to help others find their inner power, help women not make excuses and help them not apologize for their successes. You also want to help women be, and again, another great Tana quote, be bold badasses. How long is the average transition from apologizing for own success to becoming a bold ass and what's bold badass, excuse me, get it right. And what's involved in that process? Well, people that work with me will become, they can go from being a humble little weak, um, cowardly, low confidence human being to thinking that they breathe fire and a bold badass within three months. Um, however, I do audition people that I work with. So I'm not going to take a random who sees me on an interview or saw me on television. It goes to my website and says, I want to work with you. I don't work with just anybody. So I got to audition you. I got to find out, you know, are you a fame whore? Uh, do you love yourself? And you, all your photos are you in, in bikinis. I'm not interested in working with that. Um, are you using substances and all of your videos are you, you know, doing reckless car jumps and getting wasted? I'm not interested in that. So I'll, I'll coach you if I have approved you and I will have you thinking that you can move mountains and like I said, breathe fire within three months. If you don't work with somebody like me, you know, you could put in the work, you could read the books, uh, but it's a mindset. And unless you're fully immersed in it, fully immersed in it, or you follow me around or you travel with me, uh, you don't understand what it is. Um, you know, there's not really second chances with me. You were an exception, Chris, I must say. Um, and I mean, and I'm going to be honest with you. Like if we want to be, if I will be real with you, I don't give people second chances. That wasn't your fault. So that's why we're here. However, I give people one chance. If you blow me off, you waste my time. Uh, you don't do what you were told. You don't follow through on your commitment. You're out. I never work with you. Um, so people, the, uh, the humbleness typically comes in the women, for, is, is in the women. I see that a lot because women were told you can't be aggressive. You can't be assertive. You can't have those traits. Those are masculine traits um, where I'm like, hell no, guns a blazing, let's go. And you can bold face, punch people right in the face and get what you want in a gentle um, manner. However, you're getting what you want. And you can do that in three months working with me. Let's talk about The Apprentice. Okay. Why did you decide you wanted to be an apprentice and how'd you get yourself on the show? So I wanted to go on the show for one reason and one reason only uh, besides the money was my only regret in life is that I didn't finish college. And that was because my first husband was like, listen, you're never going to need it. You know, we're wealthy. It's not like you need the money. And so I was, uh, I was going into my senior year and we moved. And so when we moved, that took me off the tracks, off the course. I was going to nursing school and to go, we moved to California and to get into a nursing program, there's like a two year wait. And he allowed me to go, you know what? You're right. Screw it. Even though I've been gifted with a brain, I can learn whatever. So um, number one regret, not finishing college. The apprentice up to the date when I walked in Mark Burnett's room was all business people with law degrees, business degrees, masters, MBAs, you know, the whole nine yards. And um, here I come. And he went, oh, wow, she gave me the idea to pit entrepreneurs against the typical um, candidate that applies to be on this show. So I wanted to go to prove to myself that, you know, hey, I am still good. I am one of the best. And, and it worked. So that's the reason I did it. Um, I went on the show and um, I what was the second part? <laughs> well, how'd you get yourself on the show just by oh, pitting oh, yourself against? God. 
Oh, so you have to, you'll have to have your, your listeners um, go to my website, heytana.com, and there is my audition video. In a nutshell, I went into car dealerships, the sharks of the sales industry, right? And I sold them Mary Kay, which was what I was selling at the time, for Mother's Day, three months in advance. So I showed up, hey, do you want to buy something from me? They're trying to sell $100,000 cars. I get them in my basket. They buy. I had somebody filming me and Mark Burnett and Donald Trump said, find me that lady. And and one million eight hundred thousand people applied to be on the show. And I was one of the 18 chosen. That's incredible. And what was that experience like? Oh, it was incredible. It was life changing. While I was there, very difficult. Uh, slept like not at all. My adrenal gland was working nonstop. I got home and I had to go, you know, get medicine for my adrenal gland because that fight or flight thing that you have was like for six months. Um, it was incredible. I met some of my favorite people. Um, I got to meet Donald Trump there. So it changed everything. Uh, I fell in love with him immediately. He fell in love with me. We were two peas in a pod from day one. We didn't need to warm up to each other. Uh, we were cut from the same cloth and I loved every minute of it. I can see the energy between the two of you. So no surprises there. So, Tando, what sort of businesses do you consult? Is there an industry or industries that you specialize in? Or the clients that you take on possess particular traits that draw you to them and them to you? Um, in answer to the question, specific traits that a client will see in me and they'll say, we need that. So um, I actually don't go and look at look for businesses. They come to me. So the businesses that have come to me that I have consulted with have been businesses that know that their product is good, but they need help in the PR, uh, the communication, or the senior level um, motivation and um, leaderships. They need they need help in the leadership. So I love it because it's fun. You get in, you have a time frame. Sometimes it's a year, which I love. Sometimes it's six months, but you know, I know what the goal is. I can go in, I'm very orient, uh, goal oriented, go in, help them. I'm not part of the company. So it's really fun because everybody can be honest with me and then I can get um, to solutions really quickly. So I love it. And it's not industry specific. It's just across the board who needs help. Right. It's not industry specific. Specific, However, um, sales, if a, if a business like needs to increase sales and revenue, they reach out. Um, I helped a business save lots of money, millions of dollars, because they were being too humble and they were not touting how great they were. Industry leaders um, and their stock, their stock value was going down the toilet. And I was like, listen, what are you doing? Like, you can be making way more money if you started turning on the volume. And they were like, well, we're humble and got to be, you know, we don't want to humbly brag. I'm like, then, then you might as well just flush your business right down the toilet. If you're not going to humbly brag, the world is not going to know how good you are. And so once we started, turn, let, they let me turn that volume up, boom, millions of dollars. Like, so I love it. Well, I'm going to humbly brag for you. Your business acumen has saved clients more than $600 million, 600 million. Without giving away so many secrets that you have to charge me, share a few stories, if you would, about how you did that. Well, the, what I just shared, um, teaching them how to, to talk about themselves, how to get on television, to tell people how good their business is so that the, pers the average person would buy stock in their company and stock would go up. Um, dealing with the senior level. Some businesses have CEOs, CFOs that just suck and they don't know how to run a business. They don't know how to manage people. So I was like, let me come in, clean house, get rid of the dead weight, the bad employees. Uh, Tana's business boot camp is what it's called. I come in, see everybody. Okay, what's she doing? What's why is she going on a million smoke breaks? What's happening there? What's going on there? Oh, that person's the gossip, clean house. Let me take over for three days and then the business is running like it should be a successful business. And so a lot of employers, um, a lot of business owners, a lot of corporations have a lot of bad people working for them and they need somebody like me to come in and get rid of and fire the dead weight. And, and that makes all the difference. And so I, I enjoy being able to, I don't enjoy firing people, but if you suck, you know you suck, you should go. Um, but I enjoy cleaning up a business 
where I'm talking to the owner, the person that started this, the first person that dug a hole to start this business. And he can't figure out why his business is failing. And I'm like, it's all these people that are taking a paycheck that don't care about you. And it starts there. From time to time, we see polls about Americans' biggest fears and phobias. I can understand the second biggest fear, which is the fear of heights, because quite simply, you might die if you fall from a high place. But the number one fear among Americans is usually public speaking. Why are people so afraid of public speaking? Well, people are terrified of public speaking because um, they lack confidence in themselves. So, you know, I take a stage and I know that I know the material. I know what the demographic is of my audience. I've done my homework. Um, I know what their needs are. I know what their weaknesses are. I have talked to the person that's hired me to find out what is her or his or her objective for me coming here, for them paying me to come here to motivate their people. What do they want? So I've done my homework. It's not like I'm just walking up and going, eh, isn't this a great day? Aren't we happy to be here in, you know, Raleigh, Cal North Carolina, which I don't know much about. You know, you just can't do it. So if you don't have confidence in yourself, um, you definitely show it and, and um, you can't get up there because people can sense a phony and a fraud. And most people are phonies and frauds inside. Uh, they're living a life that nobody really knows about, or they're living a life that some of it isn't true, or they're living a life that, um, that they're not proud of. And in so many ways. And so I just think it's a lack of confidence. And I, I have a presentation called Podium Presence, where I teach executives and or you don't have to be an executive, but that's who's hired me. Um, executives or people, how to stand up and present and not look like an idiot. And it's very well received because it's very necessary and needed. Do you remember your first public speech? And given your confidence, I'm going to I shouldn't ask this question, but were you afraid? Well, so I was afraid. I do remember my first speech. It was uh, for Merrill Lynch. I was hired to be at their national sales director meeting in Florida, where the top salespeople of the entire company came and I hit it out of the park. Uh, I was afraid, of course. My heart was pounding, but I said, listen, I'm going to take that energy and I'm going to apply that and project it out. Um, to the audience. And I don't know how I did it, but I was just, you know, I just gave them everything. And I didn't care that I know for a fact they'd never heard a speaker like me. Um, I didn't care that that I have high energy and, and I mean, like through a TV, through a podcast, through a platform like what we're doing, Zoom takes 50, I repeat, 50% of my energy is going out to you, Chris, and to anybody watching. When I go live on TikTok, when I go live on Instagram, 50% of my energy is being absorbed by the medium of the TV, the cell phone, the computer. So if you can imagine what I'm like in person, <laughs> they're just like, what the hell just happened? And I'm like, listen, sit back, relax, because it's, it's, it's about to go down. And from that speech, I'll never forget it. The gentleman who hired me sent me a personal note. He said he'd been with the company for 37 years and there had never been a speaker who he had ever heard through the company that came in and did what I did. And I went, that's what I'm going to be doing. It was like, God said, this is what you do now. And I thought, well, I guess I was pretty good at that. And that was my first speech. Lightning in a bottle, it sounds like. It was fun. What were some of your most recent speeches and how did your public speaking evolve over the years from that first speech at Merrill Lynch? Uh, so my last speech was with a group of 500 women um, that kind of wanted to learn, well, they did want to learn like how to bring unity um, to, to each other uh, because women are eating, eat, we're eating our own. And the world says, oh, men are such SOBs. Oh, it's the men that, that you know, keep us from succeeding. It's the men that have that glass ceiling that we just can't break through. And I'm like, whoa, 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 uh-uh, ladies, it's you, it's you. We eat our own. I don't eat women because that's not who I am. I'm all about love and support and, you know, encouragement. However, they, so I was hired to go in and more or less shake this loose and see if we can get some people to think differently. 
Uh, it's involved because I, I have learned that, you know, I need to talk to the client and say, what examples have you had so that I can implement them in my speech? And she's like, you know, gossiping. So then I will present in the presentation, you know, five, 10 minutes on gossiping specific. Another one was, you know, um, body shaming. So then in another presentation, I'm hitting on that. So it's evolved because I have um, asked more questions from the client rather than assuming I know that's that niche, which I do, but I want more. And then the other way I've evolved is I have um, finally just said, because I have, I've never had a boss, but Donald Trump when I was working on the campaign. And, and even though he loves me and we get along great, I was under the, the, the umbrella of the GOP. So I had to play in the sandbox with people who don't play in the sandbox like me. So I had a little cloud over me, kind of like, don't do that. <gasps> don't say that. Don't speak on behalf of that. So I had that mentality that I needed to be a little more scripted, which I'm not. I'm unhinged, I'm unscripted, and I'm, unle I'm unleashed. I'm not unhinged, but I'm unscripted. And um, so now that I don't have that and I'm back to being an entrepreneur, I can say what I want. So I just said something in a speech that was so amazing and I loved it. And what, it, and it just came to me. And cause the, the last group said, the lady that hired me said, listen, I wanna know who in this corporation is the negative one. And I said, I'll get that for you. So day one, I said, hey, listen, I'm gonna be back at my table. I got books, I'd love to talk to you. We're gonna do, give it away. You know, I'm gonna be giving away a coaching session, put your name in, blah, 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 blah. So 500 ladies, the first day, maybe 200 came over. So then I spoke on Saturday morning and I was going to speak on Saturday evening. And I go, hey, listen, don't forget, ladies. Great opportunity. Come back, get your name in for that drawing. I still want to meet like-minded, positive women. And maybe 50 more came. So then at the end, for my client, Marilyn, um, last day, I said, so, Marilyn, you wanted to know who's like-minded, positive, blah, 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 blah. Ladies, if you came back to my table and you met me, you took a picture with me, you bought a book or didn't, uh, you put your name in for the drawing, raise your hand. And about 250 ladies put their hand up, which was about accurate. And I go, awesome. So do me a favor, ladies, keep your hands up. Marilyn, do me a favor, take a picture of the audience. So she does, she doesn't know what the hell she's doing it for. Get, you know, make sure you get everybody. So she did it three, one, center, Okay, cool. Okay, put that away. Everybody put your hands down. Awesome. So now what that just told Marilyn is that the ones that have your hands down, you're negative, you're probably into the gossiping, you probably don't support each other, you probably aren't big on somebody like me coming here and preaching empowerment and loving one another. And literally, I could see faces on the ground like she just freaking called us out oh, yeah. in the nicest way. And Marilyn said, thank you. Now I know who are my ne negative Nancys. And that picture was worth a thousand words. So I get to be bold. I don't care. I'm getting paid to be this way. I got nobody saying, hey, Tana, put a lid on it. One of your presentations is the art of being unforgettable. Why do you think it is that most people are reluctant to draw attention to themselves? Well, a lot of people say, I don't really got anything that's that awesome, which they do. They do. When I peel it back, I'm like, stop, you do. I had a guy I was working with the other day and he's like, listen, I, I, I don't have anything. And I said, well, then, so you're going to crawl under a rock and just call it a day? Or like, what do you mean? We're going to find something great about you. Uh, and we had to work hard. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're reluctant because they lack confidence. And nobody has said, nobody's taught them how to find out what it is that makes them different. So for example, if I said to you, hey, Chris, you probably had so many guests on the show. You know, what do you think I'm different? Why am I different? You could say whatever you'd say. What would you say? Energy, positive, charismatic, there welcoming, we powerful. How Thank much more time you. do you have? <laughs> well, I don't want to, it's not about me, but I want to thank you. So that's what they would say. So then I go, okay. So if I was just starting, I'd go, you know, welcoming, positive, energetic, you know, and all those things you said, where do we go from here? Oh, I got an idea. So I can, I'm a speaker. So let me tap into that because he liked it. But a lot of people 
aren't tapping into what people say about them. And so they don't even know what their unforgettable traits are. So I say, ask the people that are around you, what makes me different than Joey, Nancy? And then when you hear what they say, do more of that. You say that part of being unforgettable is having and being your own brand. How should someone go about creating their own brand? And what if I'm a shy or introverted person, what sort of brand should I create for myself? Well, how you go about it is you got to know what your strengths are. You got to know what you're good at. Um, I knew I was good at sales, so that's where I could start. Okay, so I'm going to sell what? Oh, positivity, energy, excitement, confidence. Um, going to teach people how to sell better. So you sort of start with one and build out. If you say, okay, I'm, I'm an introvert, you know, uh, um, I'm not really confident. I don't really have anything. I'm more of a behind the scenes person. Okay. You know, if you're behind the scenes, maybe you're behind a camera, uh, maybe you're a photographer, maybe you're a videographer, maybe you're into tech. There's a lot of people that I work with that are total introverts. And I say, get your butt behind the screen and do tech. tech there's a lot of money in tech. So, you know, we got to find out what you're good at. Okay. I just worked with a guy and he goes, man, I'm, I can't, can't be like you. You don't need to be like me. God's made you to be like you. What do you love? He goes, I love bicycles, but I hate people. Good. I got something for you. What? I, be a bike mechanic. You're not front center where the clients, the customers see you. You're backstage wrenching or you're back behind wrenching on the bikes, getting the gears to work, making the brakes work. Get your butt back there. He's like, so he messages me. He messages me. Tana, I found my passion. Being a bike mechanic has been made all the difference. I'm like, come on, man, that was so easy. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many ways, but people just, uh, they're just, they just want somebody else to do all the work for them. And they don't even want to tap into what they're good at. I know you're a believer in the power of continuous improvement. What area or areas of your life are you working on right now to continue to improve yourself? If that's even possible. Well, yes, you can always improve for sure. Uh, I'm a big believer. Um, so I'm always working at my game. I'm always wanting to be better. Improving is also taking more risks, uh, taking opportunities that present themselves. So, you know, I'm working on it and I'm not working good at it because I've been super busy, but I wanted to work towards doing a triathlon, uh, a triathlon at, at a Trump property. However, um, I got to be able to run a certain amount of miles and I haven't ran even one mile. So I'm behind schedule. Uh, but, you know, do I want to do it? I've done triathlons when I was younger. I love them. Um, but now I'm, I've got a full speaking career, a full schedule, and it's going to be hard for me to find it in. But it's a challenge and I want a challenge. So, you know, I'm a big believer that you got to find something that scares you and work towards it. So in answer to your question, that's what I'm working towards. And I hope that I can get there. If nothing else, um, you know, I'll get the miles in. I'm going on my bike, you know, later today to get the miles in. But uh, I got to get out there running and, and try to, you know, improve in that regard. It may seem counterintuitive to some, but a lot of entrepreneurs get their start during tough economic times. What advice do you have for people thinking about starting their own business, especially a young person or a woman? Well, definitely, if you want to start your own business, I'm all for it. I believe in uh, entrepreneurialism because you can go make yourself money rather than making somebody else rich. So start with what you're good at. It's, we go back to the basics. Um, during COVID, I had a client reach out to me and she said, you know, I really need to make money. My husband's laid off. I, my job is saying, you know, we're going remote and that might end up. I might lose my job. So I said, what do you, what do you like to do? Well, what she liked to do couldn't bring her in money. I like to go out partying with my friends. That's not going to be good. Uh, what else do you like to do? I like to babysit my kids. Okay. Well, I knew during COVID she couldn't, you know, be an in-home nanny because people weren't leaving. So we get to the bottom, you know, I get down to a couple hours of working with her and I find out she's an incredible seamstress. So I'm like, what if you were to start your own seamstress business? Now, if you're like me and you're going through your closet, you've got a pile of things that need mending. Well, I'm not going to be able to do it because I can't do this. I got zippers that are broken. So I said, you should start your own seamstress business. You put it out on Facebook that you're taking, you know, taking people's stuff. And if you live near me, I bring you a bag of clothes right now. So she started a business doing something that she did for free for family members. 
and, and it's doing well as a matter of fact. So, you know, I always say there's always a way um, you just need to find that niche, find something that people, a service that people need and do it and do it the best. There's the old saying that we're the sum of the five people closest to us. So the idea is that we want to surround ourselves with bright, ambitious, focused, optimistic, and an honorable inner circle. First off, do you believe that? And second, you don't need to name names if you don't want to, but whether it's in business or personal life, what do your five closest people add to your life? I totally believe it. Um, I use it in my presentations quite a bit, just um, when I'm speaking to the youth, just to let them realize that if they're hanging around, people that are doing bad things, you know, even if they're not, that's still draining on them. So yes, what, uh, so the five people that I have in my life that I'm most close with or spend the most time with, um, bring love, support, um, humor. I love humor. And a lot of my friends go, you know, I'm trying to dissect who you hang around and why you hang around only a certain group of people. And I want to laugh. So I love people that bring humor, uh, fun to the party. And so uh, one of my best friends, she definitely brings the humor. One of my other best friends, she brings the love and the support, um, the humor as well. Support, confidence, I, I mean, yeah, not confidence, I've got that. But I look for um, people that make me feel good around because I'm typically the show pony that people say, you know, trot her out. We want to, hey, bring Tana for the fun. So when somebody can be the show pony for me, I love that. Um, and that's an analogy I use a lot. And my family gets it. They're like, oh God, here they, they want the show pony. And I'm like, the show pony's in the stable. She don't want to come out. But um, so that I, I don't have anybody in my life that um, is negative. Don't even associate with it. You weren't a professional political, political consultant, yet you were one of the first hires on Donald Trump's presidential campaign in 2015. What are the differences between business world and competition in the political arena? Oh, well, the differences, uh, okay, so I chose to treat the politic, politics like a business, never been in it. Um, I didn't enjoy it. I thought the people were you know, lazy, weak, um, people would take a paycheck and not even care if the candidate won, uh, which I talk a lot about in presentations, corporations, and for people who are looking for political coaching. Uh, make sure the people that work for you really care if you win or lose and if you your business makes money. Um, so that's me personally. I chose to treat them the same, which was a good thing because, you know, we did well. But I did not enjoy the people that worked in politics versus the people that work out in the business world because I get to choose who works with me and who I work with being an entrepreneur, which is a really great trait. I don't have to work for a jerk. Uh, I don't have to take crap. I don't have to go somewhere I don't want to go. So it's always positive. It's always fun where I had to work with a team that um, a lot of them weren't good. And a lot of them I would never even associate with because they were, we were, they were just not capable um, doers. And I'm a doer and I only want to work with people that actually do stuff and execute and get it done. We're just about out of time, but I want our listeners to know that you're back in the politic arena, political arena as a consultant, now teaching first-time candidates how to run a campaign. Where can people find you if they'd like to reach out about their campaign or have you as a motivational speaker? Thank you for asking. So you, the best way to go reach me is to go to my website, hey, H-E-Y, Tana, T-A-N-A, dot com. But I'm on Instagram, hey, Tana. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Facebook, Tana Gertz. Uh, so if you go to my website and go over to the contact page, you can find me over there. Um, I'm everywhere. You can't miss me. Google me and you'll run into me. Uh, but I'd love it. I'd love to, to meet some of you and tell me you saw me here. One more time, what's the website? HeyTana.com. Perfect. And lastly, with a minute or so left, what final words of advice would you offer to our audience to help them be more resilient, more self-empowered, and to set the right goals and achieve them? Well, definitely, you'd have to have persistence. I, I think back at, at when I started and where I'm at right now, and the common denominator is persistence, never giving up. Uh, client I wanted to get so bad, I had to reach out to her eight times to get the job uh, and get it done. And it has, it's paid way, way off. So persistence, being fearless, those are the two traits that if you apply them into your life, you will get what you want. 
like you said, the beginning of the show, you sell energy and you sold me today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate you having me. No, thanks for being with us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning into this week's episode of Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place with another leader from the world of business, politics, public policy, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.